If you listen carefully to the voluntary after the service, you may see that today, or you may hear more likely today, that we are marking an important moment in the life of the Royal Air Force. It was rather difficult to mark it last Sunday because it was Easter Sunday when it really took place, but it was 100 years since its foundation. My uncle, who I grew up living next door to, uh, was a pilot in the Air Force. He loved very much the time that he spent there uh, and the Air Force. He trained uh, at Cranwell uh, and that he hated very much. He described it as three years of mindless pursuit of unobtainable rules and standards. They arrived in their first year and they were told that the floor of the barracks was to be spotless at all times, that inspections were unannounced and they could take place any time of the night or the day. They were smart men, training to be officers, so they decided the easiest thing would be to say that there was a strict rule that everybody removed their boat boots the moment they entered the barracks. Well, the next day, a new rule was in place for the lot of them. Shoes were to be worn at all times. Again, they put their heads together and they hatched a plan. They sewed thongs of leather onto bits of carpet flipped upside down. Every time they went into the barracks, they slipped these on over their boots, and as they glided around, they polished the floor as they went. Well, of course, the officer in charge was furious at having been outsmarted, so the next thing he did was set them to painting coal white. When they had it spotless and shining, then, surprise, surprise, it turned out that the pile of coal was actually needed at the other end of the airbase. And once it had been moved there, you guessed it, it needed to be painted white again. He was not a man of faith, but his experience perfectly captures what it means to be under the law, what Paul is talking about in the reading we heard today. It's to be constantly attempting to abide by rules and regulations beyond the ability of any person to keep. And what's more, whilst keeping every single one of them, if it were even possible, simply satisfies your overlord, breaking a single one of them produces anger and punishment. Thank God that it is not so for us. This is what is at the heart of the Gospel and what St Paul is drawing out in his fourth chapter of the letter to the Romans. It's wonderful news that we are under grace and not under law. God accepts us with no conditions whenever we put our trust in the atoning sacrifice of his Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. St Augustine, making the same point, put it this way. He said, this is a rule, love God and do as you please. Love God and do as you please. Within the context, it's this. Once for all then, he says, a short precept is given thee. Love God and do as you please. Whether you hold your peace, through love hold your peace. Whether you cry out, through love cry out. Whether you are correct, through love be correct. Whether you are wrong, through love be wrong. Whether you spare, through love spare. Let the root of love be within you. Of this root, nothing can spring but that which is good. We as Christians no longer live our lives according to a list of commands of do this and don't do that. We no longer submit ourselves to a, a rigid pattern of what is right and what is wrong, what's good and what's bad. Instead, as Christians, we live our lives according to one standard, that which Christ gave to his disciples on the night before he died. That ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. There's no law greater than this. In this is bound up all of the law and all of the prophets, all that had gone before. Love is our only rule. Love is the revelation of God to the world. St Paul says that it is by faith 
in this good news, in this revelation, in this gospel, that we become children of God. Not children under the law, but children under grace through faith. And to demonstrate his point, he relates the story, as we heard, of Abraham's great faith in God. Now, you may be thinking that this is all good news, but the way that Paul explains it, it seems to rather depend upon having the kind of unwavering and superhuman faith for which Abraham is famed and that Paul draws out. This is, of course, Abraham I'm speaking of here, the man who was told and willingly went to sacrifice even his own son so as to demonstrate the depth of the faith which he had in God. Can we, of such little faith, be made righteous through the small amount that we have? Or maybe it would be better for us to stick to the law. Well, this morning at 9.30, our gospel reading was that of St. Thomas, of doubting fame, as the poor disciples known. And the one point I was trying to make there is that whilst almost all of the disciples doubted, he's the only one known by that epithet. It could be said of Abraham too, that despite the write-up that Paul gives him here, which is very glowing, Abraham too was a doubter. Paul oversells Abraham's faith um, just a little bit. Listen to what we're told in the story in Exodus. God sends Abraham to Canaan. Then because there's not enough food there, this is the land that God has promised to Abraham where he'll have many descendants, where there'll be uh, milk and honey flowing, the land that God's prepared for him. He sends Abraham there. Abraham has enough time to stop, to build an altar in thanks to God. And then because there's a famine in the land, he flees immediately, not trusting in God's provision for him, down to Egypt. And as he gets down to Egypt, he knows that he has to ask a favour of Pharaoh, and he knows that his wife Sarai, as she is at the time, is very beautiful. And so what does he do? He hauls her out to Pharaoh so he can get a good deal. This is the man of enormous faith, so we're meant to believe. God promises Abraham that his ancestors will populate the world and will be given the land, the one from which he's recently fled, but no heir appears on the scene because, as we know, Sarai is barren. So when Abraham is 86, having got fed up of the waiting, his uh, faith creaking a little bit, he has a son instead with Hagar, that's Sarai's servant girl. Again, God turns up on the scene, reminds Abraham of his promise, and in the meantime, he has to clear up the feud between Sarai and Hagar. Hagar has uh, fled because Sarai's been getting jolly cross and nasty with her. And uh, God has promised Abraham that his child will be the father of many nations. And so God's now got a problem on his hands because he's got a child planned through Sarah, which hasn't happened yet. And he's also got this son just born of Hagar. In God's limitless goodness and abundant generosity, he says to Hagar, well, your son could be the father of many nations as well then. Let's have them all being the father of many nations. He finds a way to sort everybody out. Thirteen years later, God returns once more to Abraham, changing his name to Abraham this time and his wife's name to Sarah, and saying to him, I will bless your wife Sarah and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And what does Abraham do? Well, we're told, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. He said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? This is the man whose faith is enough for Paul. This is the man who by his faith is under grace and not under the law. So don't be worried if your faith feels a bit thin or flimsy because so was Abraham's and so were the disciples and so have been all those who have gone before us in the faith. If what mattered was having perfect faith, then that would simply be yet another unobtainable law. We would be under the law again, but it's not what matters. It's not like that 
for us anymore. Although we cannot but get things wrong, although the law is too hard for us to keep, although we can't keep every floor shiny and every bit of coal in the right place and the right colour, nevertheless, God in grace forgives us completely. Or it's more true to say, has already forgiven us completely. It's by his infinite grace that we are saved. Not by our moral character, not by our deeds or words, no matter how righteous and outstanding they might be. Not by commandment keeping, and I'm afraid not by church going either. We have nothing to do in order to receive the grace of God, but simply to give thanks for God's total pardon of us. Amen.